Kelly Tiefen, uh, one of the uh, co-chairs of the Academy's Grand Browns Committee. I want to thank you guys all for coming. We're really excited for Dr. Whitfield to give her talk today. Dr. Whitfield is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and we're thrilled that we get to have her here in Colorado with all of her skills and expertise. She attended medical school at the University of Wisconsin and then completed a residency and fellowship at George Washington University in Washington, DC, uh, obviously residency in emergency medicine and then completed fellowship in global health and obtained her MPH in that process at GW. Uh, she was started in Colorado as the director of the Global Health Track at CU School of Medicine. And I think uh, those of us who were around for that really saw how she elevated the Global Health Track at CU to a status that it had not known before. And now it's one of the most popular tracks, if not the most popular track at the school. And she followed that with being the uh, founder and first fellowship director of the Global Health Fellowship in Emergency Medicine in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, you can also read her um, op-ed on global health rotations that was published in, or sort of in volunteerism that was published in the Washington Post. And besides all of these academic accolades, she's also just a great person and a really great doctor and clinician. So uh, we're so happy to have her and thank you so much, Jen, for being here today. We're all super excited to hear what you've got to teach us. So thank you, Jen, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Thiessen. Um, and uh, I wanna extend a couple of thank yous actually, particularly to Dr. Thiessen uh, for staying awake post night shift last night. I told her to go to bed and I would introduce myself and she said um, that I wouldn't be effusive enough. And so kudos to her. So thank you very much for the effusive praise. <laughs> um, and thank you to the Academy of Medical Educators. I'm really excited. This is a topic I'm super passionate about. And um, it's been really nice to have the opportunity to update this lecture and kind of see what else has been brewing in the world of um, ethics and uh, global health practices and electives. <clears throat> um, so let's get started. I'm going to try to keep this to about 40 minutes hoping this generates some discussion um, and I'm um, gonna move on from there. All right, so the issues to ponder on this topic that, that really of interest to me and that I wanted to tackle is, um, I wanna talk a little bit about why global health experiences, both volunteerism and electives have become so popular, particularly in the past 20 to 25 years. Um, I also want to talk about uh, what we know about the effect of global medical missions and the electives um, on the volunteer physicians and the trainees who undertake them. Um, I had hoped to do a lecture when I first made this and also when I updated it on the effect of these rotations and experiences on the populations that they serve, uh, but there's so little data out there um, that it's unfortunately not something that we can really analyze at this point, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then the questions become, what can we do to adequately prepare our trainees, both residents and medical students, to take uh, these global health electives sustainably, ethically, and in a way that's truly transformative to them and their careers? And moreover, what makes for a good global health experience? What, what should we be looking for when we're trying to find opportunities for our students or for ourselves if we're interested in working in the global sphere? Sorry, my slide advancer was working might be just a little bit delayed. So I apologize if there's a bit of delay and I advanced the slides. Um, just to clarify, this is not a critique of like disaster relief work when you go into a, a hotspot after an earthquake or a, a complex humanitarian emergency. It's a kind of a different ball of wax and has its own uh, complications, uh, but not really what we're discussing today. It's not really a commentary on long-term global health work like uh, Doctors Without Borders. Um, it's again kind of a, a different thing. Uh, we're not going to do an analysis of non-clinical global work, so public health measures or sustainable 
I'm sorry, uh, capacity building projects. Um, really want to focus kind of on the clinical uh, ethical dilemmas. Um, and it's not an evaluation of what's called medical tourism. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard that term, but it's basically uh, when uh, usually people from high income countries go to lower income countries um, to access, have access to cheaper, usually specialized care. Um, there's actually more published on that than there is on <laughs> when I was doing this lecture, um, but that's, um, the terminology can be a little confusing, so I just wanted to make sure that was clear. <clears throat> so, to, and just a couple of definitions. Again, I'm sorry, there's a bit of a delay here. Uh, definition of a short-term medical mission, when I throw it around in this lecture, is travel undertaken by health professionals to resource poor areas in med uh, as medical volunteers. Usually these are anywhere from two weeks to like two months. Um, in length um, and uh, again are almost always clinical you're going and treating patients. A global health elective is travel undertaken by medical trainees such as residents and medical students to international often low resourced clinical settings to provide clinical care and to enhance their own medical education. Um, these are some pictures of one of my fellow in the lower left hand corner and then some students uh, rotating in Nepal and in South Africa. So um, before I move forward, I do want to talk a little bit of why I indulge in this topic um, and have remained active in it for about 10 years. Um, I was, um, I don't know, a case study and kind of what not to do, I think. <laughs> uh, when I was a medical student, um, I'd grown up in Wisconsin in Madison, hadn't lived anywhere else, was itching to do something else and to really expand my own education um, and experiences. And so when I finished medical school, I um, took a year off before I did residency and I chose to volunteer my time in a small clinic in Eastern Guatemala called the Actenemy Project. Um, and uh, this was pre-internet, not pre-internet completely, I'm not quite that old, um, but pre like search engine, like any sort of um, um, helpful way to sort of research research global health electives and, and opportunities. And so I did what I could to figure out uh, what this experience would be like. And, and the research I, I had done revealed that there was a physician working at this clinic, a board certified physician, and I would be working under her tutelage. Um, and um, so I went uh, right after I finished uh, medical school and I got down there and it turned out that physician hadn't been there for several months. She had moved back to Guatemala City. There were um, several health promotores that worked there who had varying levels of experience. Um, they were wonderful. Um, no one spoke English, obviously, which I knew, but they also, um, most of the patients spoke Kechi. They didn't speak Spanish. And so I had to rely on translating between um, the promotores from Kechi into Spanish. Um, and my Spanish was not amazing either. Um, I was definitely trying to wing it. Um, while I was there, I delivered a lot of babies. I treated asthma. I did a lot of machete wound repairs. And it was up to me to decide if a patient was sick enough to spend a whole lot of money to put them in a boat and transfer them about an hour upriver to um, a uh, government-run hospital. Um, so I had to do some pretty advanced triage and make some pretty scary decisions on very little information and even less education and experience. Um, uh, you know, this... In this experience, I was going to be down there for a year. I ended up doing it for six months because I was so, it was scary and it was hard. And I was terrified that I was going to have an outcome that was so bad that would sort of sour me on clinical medicine altogether. Um, and as disappointing as it was that this wasn't the sort of flowery, exciting experience that I thought it would be, um, it uh, again was transformative and it really made me say, you know, if I feel this way, I probably am not the only person who struggles with these issues. Um, so I really wanted to delve deeper into it. So anyway, I finished um, my project there. I did residency. I did a global health fellowship. Um, and since then, I've really focused on the ethics of, this, of uh, these volunteer opportunities and medical electives. And I've really focused my own personal work on capacity building and teaching as opposed to clinical work. Um, anyway. So in finding out if I were truly alone, um, I wanna share with you the information that I found. Um, and I wanna tackle this idea of the myth of mere charity. I, when I had gone down to Guatemala and anytime I expressed my concern about what I was doing down there, uh, the most common thing that people said back to me was like, well, you know, it's better than nothing. At least you're there providing some care. At least it's better than nothing. 
And um, I wanted to push back on that a little bit for two reasons. This idea that some care is better than nothing is really based in sort of a colonial roots of global health work. Um, global health volunteerism is historically unidirectional. It's sort of a charity model with this tacit belief that high income countries are superior. Even that term medical mission, quote unquote, kind of denotes a calling or to help or to save others. Um, and this approach that we were coming from high income countries to actually go and do good and to provide care because we're quote unquote better um, than the countries that we were serving has really gone unchallenged until the, really the last, I would say 15 to 20 years. Um, as volunteers and learners alike, they sort of recognize the limitations of their own capabilities when they're in these settings. But they still promoted this idea that their input, however flawed, was better than nothing. And unfortunately, I think global health education and our the elective model has been born out of that. Okay, so um, we we send learners to learn, but also to serve, um, and we think that they are necessarily doing good because their care must be better than what's a, what is actually available there. And learn, learners come back with these, lauding these opportunities that they had to do procedures under very little supervision or got opportunities to provide clinical care that they can't at home. Uh, they just stole these exposures to new and later stages of disease. Um, and they describe how this experience was so transformative in a very positive way in their journey to a particular specialty or even to the field of medicine itself. Any of you who have reviewed personal statements for uh, students who are trying to apply to residency have probably read any number of these that start with, I was working in X country and um, what I saw, what I did truly affected me and, and uh, my journey into medicine. Um, and you know, I think students too, and I, I spent a little time on studentdoctor.net and, and reviewing what students were saying, this idea that they said, well, you know, we were not perfect and what we did may not have been um, the best care of what of that could have been provided. And that's regrettable, of course, but certainly better than this apparent alternative, no care at all. <clears throat> so what we know though now is that when you go into an area and you think there's no care, there probably actually is care. What we haven't done is we haven't done the homework to figure out what the health infrastructure is locally that is already in place, nor have we made the right efforts to coordinate and collaborate with those organizations. Secondly, the idea that some care is better than none really needs to be turned on its head because I think we all know that if you go in and you provide the wrong care, that can be certainly worse than no care at all. Um, and again, I think the tide is turning. We're starting to do some qualitative interviews with students, with uh, residents, with returning providers. There's more and more data that's actually, we're interviewing preceptors, so people who are supervising our medical students and trainees in other countries to get their input and what they would like to see change. Um, and that has been extraordinarily helpful, I think, in helping us as educators figure out a better path forward to approaching global health electives. Um, this uh, missionary on trial picture that I have up here, I just wanted to um, prompt me um, to uh, see if anyone kind of remembers this story. This is Renee Bach. She was about 18 or 19. She was a, um, um, a young woman who decided to go to Uganda and uh, work as um, a healthcare provider, for lack of a better term, um, in a children's uh, nutrition center. And she was there for several years and was doing things that really should only be performed by a physician or an advanced care nurse and, and really had no medical training whatsoever. And this title is actually from a New Yorker as recently as, as 2020, where they, they discuss this idea that, well, if she hadn't been there, would these kids have survived at all? Um, and the article kind of, <laughs> I bristled at the article, but it's an interesting, it, it was interesting to me that this topic is still happening because when the story broke, I was, I was sort of like, well, no, this isn't okay because if you turn that around, if someone had come to the US and done the same thing, we'd all unequivocally be horrified. And so we need to really address the, this double standard and this idea of, of mere charity being better than nothing. So what do we know? <clears throat> Um, well, we know that the popularity of global health electives and volunteerism has skyrocketed. Um, so since 
the early 1980s, the number of medical students who are embarking on global health electives has really exponentially grown. In 1984, there were approximately um, about 6% of students who were doing global health electives. By 2015, we were hitting about 36 to 40%, and that number has stayed relatively stable in the low 30s since that time. Students are really excited about traveling abroad, and I don't know why, I don't have a great handle on why, I just know it is. Um, there have been a few qualitative interviews with students as to why they have done it. I pulled a quote here that I really liked, but, the 24-hour news cycle, I think this, um, I think we've done a good job as educators emphasizing the humanism of medicine and health equality and how important that is. And we're recruiting a specific type of person into medical schools truly interested in addressing health equity um, and global health issues, underserved populations. Um, and um, it's really grown into quite an industry. There's, um, in 2017, when I first started this lecture, the last data I could see was, uh, there was an estimate that, was that volunteerism is a, about a $250 million per year industry. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, we've seen it exponentially rise. I think the reasons are, are numerous, um, but it's here to stay. What are the effects of doing these short-term medical missions on our volunteers? Um, like I said, we don't know for sure. Um, there's some literature reviews out there. There's some things that are published. I actually found one article in 2012 that reviewed, um, that co collected all of these articles that had discussed medical missions and medical volunteerism in global health settings. And they noted that about 80% of those articles actually focused on the participants. So we really, the 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 vast majority of the data that we have on this, that what we know is what the effect is on the volunteer. Um, these are some of the things that volunteers have said it was the effect of, the, of embarking on these missions was that they had opportunities to reconnect to the reasons they became doctors. They honed primary clinical skills, they gained perspective. Some expressed concern that they felt like this was a band-aid on a gaping wound, that the issues that they saw were far, far um, more significant than anything they could do or affect change in in a two to four week uh, rotation. Um, that lower right hand corner article is something that popped up from the, um, if anyone's familiar with the onion, um, and I couldn't resist because I feel like it completely applied to me when I was <laughs> going abroad. Um, so I hope I'm not offending anybody with some of these things. I just couldn't resist keeping that one in there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the effect on trainees, because that actually we know a little bit more about. Um, we as academicians like to know what's happening with our trainees. And so we've, uh, we've been asking them, which is great. Um, students self-report increased cultural competence. They think more positively about students or um, people from other cultures. They feel they have greater insight and empathy with their patients. Um, they feel they have better communication awareness, both verbal and nonverbal, with coworkers and with their patients. So those are all good things. Um, they also express a deeper understanding of practice issues, um, of healthcare systems and the role of family and culture um, and patient care, a heightened understanding and awareness of waste and resource utilization. Um, these pictures are uh, were given to me with permission from one of our students who was rotating in South Africa. And you can see on the upper left-hand corner where a blanket has been placed on the ground after they ran out of gurneys in uh, one of the, uh, in Kailicha Hospital in uh, Cape Town. And, and on the right, one of the students is using a mayo tray um, to prepare to do sutures on a patient. Um, there's an increased awareness of the role and importance of public health and patient care. And they had increased in confidence and appreciation of physical exam skills. Um, so these are all good. Um, effects on career, I'm guessing a lot of you have actually heard some of this before, um, but there's a lot of self-reported evidence that students who embark on global health electives are more likely to choose primary care specialties, especially pediatrics and family practice. Um, there is evidence that they want to work with underserved population. There was one study that reported that students who had done a global health elective uh, was uh, about 80% of them actually plan to incorporate global health into their future career. Um, and another study that showed 30% we're planning on getting an MPH later on in their career as opposed to 3% uh, of the control group. 
Um, the limitations of all of these studies is again that they are self-reported. We are taking a cadre or a cohort of students and trainees who are already interested in global health who then went ahead and did a global health elective. We are self-selecting students who already want to go into primary care specialties for the most part, who already want to work with underserved populations who are committed to issues of health equity um, and public health issues. Um, so again, while this is uh, intriguing and I think encouraging that the global health electives are a good thing. Um, there's obviously ma massive flaws in how we're studying it. Um, so it is more complicated than that. Um, so like I said, in the last few years, I think um, educators and researchers alike have done a really nice job of delving deeper and talking to students, doing qualitative interviews on students when they return from these electives to find out exactly what is the effect. Um, and what we're seeing is something a little bit closer to what my experience personally was in Guatemala. Um, students are expressing this uncertainty about how best to help. Um, they're noting a perception of Western medical students as different than local students. Moving beyond one scope of practice, um, the ethical dilemmas of navigating different cultures of medicine, and this idea of unilateral capacity building where they're going and they're earning, they're gaining so much from this experience but not giving back. And so I want to talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. Um, and I've added quotes at the bottom of all of these that I found quite striking from some of these interviews. Um, and uh, I, hope, uh, I hope they're impactful to um, y'all as well as I go through this. So this uncertainty about how to help students are, uh, I, th I think students in general are uncertain on how to help. Certainly when they rotate through the department, our department and the, the walls are caving in, um, they want to help, but there's always this, well, how do we do it? And I think that's magnified um, significantly when you place them in a global health situation where the need often outweigh, or, um, is, exceeds the capacity to help. Um, the, uh, the student uh, it, that was quoted at the bottom of this, um, actually, uh, the backstory for her was she was in a small hospital in Latin America, and she there was a patient there who was having seizures and was hospitalized, and the patient's seizures were frequent enough that she couldn't, there wasn't enough medication to abort the seizures when the patient had the seizure, and um, also there wasn't even someone who could attend the patient every time the patient had a seizure. And so this medical student said she, she would just sit by, she just or witness basically she sat with the patient and through their seizures and and just the one thing she could do was to be present um, and that's a big deal I think that's a lot for a student to handle um, and um, transformative yes but much more nuanced than this sort of positivity that we might um, otherwise attribute again to these global health experiences mm -hmm. Um, this perception of Western trainees is different. Um, it was absolutely happening. So patients and staff in other countries can overestimate the student's skills and knowledge. It can be a bit of a side effect of something called task shifting. So task shifting is, is something that's actually employed in lower resource settings um, pretty often. It's when you train a cadre of providers um, to do specific skills and procedures that they wouldn't normally be trained to do because there is a need for someone else to be doing these. So an example might be, um, so here in the States, physicians are the ones who suture for the most part that in advanced care providers and in um, uh, some locations in Africa, especially where the students are rotating in Cape Town, some of the nurses are able to suture. Um, the caveat to that is, so the side effect of that is that um, when these students visit, Providers and uh, nurses aren't really, uh, they don't understand exactly what the students' capabilities are and what they've been trained to do. And they can often underestimate what students can do. Um, one qualitative study from the Solomon Islands that uh, interviewed nurses and physicians there um, found that they, somewhere upwards of 90% of the nurses and providers thought that medical students should be able to prescribe medicines and treat patients on their own, which is certainly not something that we do here. Um, and other students expressed a real concern that they were getting more recognition and learning opportunities and being asked to do procedures when, um, instead of local providers because of the color of their skin and where they were from and these sort of ass assumptions that they knew more than they actually did. Um, and then, 
Uh, again, students were often asked to perform or allowed in some cases to perform beyond the scope of their practice. So they were given responsibilities that exceeded their level of training. Some sought these opportunities and others were sort of left to their own judgment. Um, one student described being asked to counsel a patient who had just received a new diagnosis of HIV. Um, and she wasn't really given any guidance or supervision on how to do that. Um, she was worried that she gave the incorrect information to that patient and that the patient would then have to go somewhere else to get the appropriate counseling at a personal cost. Um, so this is something that appears again and again um, that I don't think surprises any of us. Navigating different cultures of medicine. This is pretty interesting too. Um, something that comes up a lot when we work in other settings is these cultural differences. Um, a few that are really common, I think that I've heard students say is um, accounts of, so privacy and confidentiality where exams, pelvic exams, things were being done in rooms without curtains, without doors, um, lack of hand washing between patients, lack of obtaining consent, um, lack of disclosing the level of the trainee's experience to the patients. Um, different uses of pain medication. Um, they want to avoid appearing paternalistic and applying their own value system to a different culture, but to also respect the integrity of the patient interaction. And I think that's difficult for anyone, but if we don't send a student without some understanding that these things will happen and some roadmap on how to navigate these, I think they're setting the student up for a really tough experience. And then finally, this idea of unilateral capacity building. Students are acutely aware that they're getting more than they give when they do these experiences. Um, they fear a lack of real impact or sustainability in the work that they're doing and a drain on local resources. They recognize that these preceptors, these physicians who are training them as, um, overseas are overworked themselves and are taking time out of their schedules in order to train people. So that's kind of what we know in terms of students. Again, super nuanced. Um, it's really encouraging to see these qualitative interviews happening and knowing that these experiences are really complicated and there's a lot of good, but there's also some challenges that need to be addressed. Um, so I'm gonna switch a little bit and talk about um, what we know about the effect, quote unquote, or what the perception is of these electives and experiences. Um, on the people who are affected by them in country. Um, and again, there's not much. Um, I found a, a handful of studies that I can glean from and I wanna talk a little bit about the highlights from those. Um, and then I'm gonna circle back and talk a little bit about how we can uh, prepare our trainees um, to both find good uh, elective experiences and to prepare themselves. So um, host, preparation, or host perceptions of volunteers and, and uh, trainees. Um, again, not much. Um, this article from 2009 that I have referenced at the bottom was actually, the first author was a student at CU, um, and this study was done um, through CU and a site in Guatemala. Um, I don't know if it was the Trifinio site actually in, uh, that uh, the Center for Global Health runs, but uh, anyway, they sat down with I think 72 healthcare providers, public health officials, and patients in Guatemala and asked them, hey, what do you think about these electives and, and these experiences, these volunteer experiences that these uh, Americans coming down and providing care? And this is what they found. Um, the uh, um, Guatemalans felt that the, the uh, electives and the um, volunteer experiences provided usually surgical care. It was generally what they called reactionary. So they'd see a disease and then kind of try to help. Um, it was episodic, often it was specialist care, and they did uh, remark that it was usually free of charge and it did focus on rural and underserved areas. Um, what they felt was needed, however, was more health education, um, a more robust process for disease screening. They needed improved public health infrastructure and improved access to primary care. So you can see there's a disconnect um, in some ways on what was felt was needed and what was actually provided. Um, I want to talk a little bit about medicine donations because that was something that was brought up in this study where um, they were concerned about the medications that were being donated. Uh, I think we've all kind of seen when um, or heard about large shipments of medical donations of expired or unused medications leaving the United States to go to other countries. And that in and of itself is a giant topic. Um, I've, uh, a couple of the pharmacists actually at CU give uh, lectures on this and they're phenomenal. 
Um, and here's just a quote from the WHO when they were trying to address this. And you can see this example of a donation that went to Sudan in the 1990s. The medications that were given were really inappropriate, appetite stimulants, contact lens solution, x-ray solutions, um, you know, the patients didn't need Lipitor. <laughs> um, so it, of the 50 boxes, about 12 actually contained drugs of some use. And you could say, well, at least 12 were of some use, but then for the rest of the donations had to be disposed of safely. Otherwise they end up on the black market, they end up in dangerous places. And so there's a real harm done to um, sending out, um, to donating medications without giving it some thought and coordination. One of the other concerns from hosts were the silos of care. So um, this idea of going in and fixing a problem without addressing the upstream issues. So deworming campaigns in areas that didn't have clean water sources were a bit futile. Um, giving out free eyeglasses without doing eye exams. And then duplication of efforts and care where mobile clinics or um, these temporary medical missions would come down and set up a clinic for two weeks and then disappear. And there might be one five, five miles down the road because no one's talking, no one's coordinating. Um, who's coming and who's doing what. Um, there was a lot of concern about this culture of victimization where the pitfalls of not only providing free care, um, but um, care that was um, sort of not reliable and not interacted, interactive and collaborative with the local community. Um, they were worried this would lead to disinvestment in their own health care and dependence on foreign aid, which is a concern that has been brought up in other um, by other experts and economists as well. A lot of these providers in Guatemala actually recommended a sliding scale system. Um, and you know, I think healthcare economics is a really big topic and the idea of whether or not care should be free is really difficult and controversial. But what I thought was really interesting about this is that it wasn't just one person saying, hey, we're not victims, we need to be empowered to take care of ourselves and this is not the best way to be doing it. Um, in terms of the local infrastructure, again, the concerns about supply and equipment donation came up. They were worried this would dissuade the government from investing in its own systems. Um, if the government saw that uh, there were foreign uh, clinics being set up, they might be dissuaded from investing um, in building their own clinics. Um, they saw that it competed with local practitioners. I think a lot of these volunteer opportunities, these mobile clinics would come down and set up and wouldn't actually realize that there might be a clinic nearby um, and um, hadn't really done that homework, hadn't been able to do that homework to figure out how, first of all, not to compete with them, but also to find a way to collaborate with them. A lack of reciprocal opportunities is a big deal. And this is still a problem that we see. Um, we have spent a lot of time historically going down and providing care and sending our trainees down uh, for global health experiences, but we're not bringing providers up to us to work and uh, observe in our clinics. And uh, there is a clamoring for reciprocity um, among our providers and our, our partners in country. Um, and then finally, not enough collaboration with local providers. Uh, they've noted that it doesn't do much good to go down and set up a clinic or to work in a clinic for two weeks, give out medications, give advice without some follow-up, without some way of making sure that the care can continue once the medical mission ends. And then finally, there is a burden on the host um, that maybe was not anticipated by the volunteers or trainees. I think trainees actually are pretty good at identifying this, um, but language barriers and using healthcare workers as translators is obviously a pretty big strain on an already strained system. There were other local expenditures that were sometimes borne by the hosts. And then the cost for follow-up care. Um, this is especially important looking at surgical safaris and surgical missions. Um, I think we love in theory, I think the idea of having a bunch of providers be able to come down um, and do cataract surgeries or cleft palate repairs is awesome. Um, but the devil is in the details with these. What is their follow-up care? What surgeons are gonna take care of these patients when they have post-operative complications? Um, there's the very little data that's out there shows that the complication rate from these surgeries is actually about what we see in the States and in Canada, which is encouraging, but there's still complications and we still need to partner with our physicians and our providers in country to make sure that patients get the care they need after their surgical, their surgeries happen. So knowing all this, I think as educators and as preceptors for students and, and residents who really want to embark on these global health experiences, 
we have to take it upon ourselves to make sure we are allowing our trainees the best chance of success in their global health electives. We have to craft what I call a best practice approach to creating these experiences, vetting these experiences and preparing our students. Moreover, it's our responsibility to help them do the research to figure out what the right uh, global health experience is. Um, whether or not we're crafting it or we're jumping onto one that already exists. And I think there's ways to do that. And I want to talk about both in uh, the following slides. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> so crafting the elective experience, moving towards this best practice framework. It's wonderful to see even in the past, like I said, five to seven years, a lot of attention has been paid to crafting and preparing uh, medical electives abroad that are ethical, that are sustainable, that are collaborative, and truly, like I said, transformative for the learners. While at least um, sometimes affording benefit to our hosts, but at least mitigating the, um, any harm or any downside there might be to uh, the presence of our students and volunteers. Um, so one good literature review really broke it down well, I think, into responsibilities of the institution and responsibilities of the student. The responsibilities of the institution is, first of all, safety of our students. So occupational health, malpractice coverage, what happens and do we have a plan for needle stick injuries, for road traffic accidents, medical evacuation? Um, we need to keep, make sure that we are keeping our students abreast of any travel advisory issues, pre and post departure training. Um, and we should have a formal agreement with the host institution. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next slide. The responsibilities of the students would include making sure that they are doing what they need to do to prepare for travel, um, ensuring their own personal safety and making wise decisions around how to keep themselves safe in country. A commitment to the preparation process. If we're going to give them good pre-departure training, then they need to engage in it and, and participate in that. Um, and then a commitment to the ethical code of their home institution um, that has to continue while in country. So again, what are the responsibilities of the institution? The malpractice injury evacuation. Um, I worked, when I was the global health track director, I worked really closely with the U and there were a lot of um, I's that needed to be dotted and a lot of T's that needed to be crossed to make sure that students did have this in place, which was really important. Um, they, uh, we all had plans and the students, and I can talk about this a little bit in the student responsibilities, but um, even in applying to do a global health elective, they had to be very clear about what hospitals were available. Did they have the, co the um, evacuation coverage? What were we gonna do if there was a bad outcome for one of our students? Um, so there was a lot of contingency planning happening at an institutional level and at the student level. Um, in terms of training, this is something I really tried to work on when I was the track director, but um, what's great is that there is consensus among a lot of educators that not only is pre-departure training essential, um, but what should be included in that is pretty straightforward. Uh, one thing that a lot of educators are saying is case-based ethics scenarios, and you can get access to these online for free. I have some resources at the end of the lecture that I can share. Um, but there's good evidence that walking students through potential ethical dilemmas can be enormously helpful. Students need to be trained up on what the local burden of disease is, what are they, what conditions they're going to be seeing. Um, any attempts, this is difficult, right, cultural competency, I feel like it's sort of nebulous term to a certain extent, but um, something that we've tried to do, that me and some of my colleagues have tried to do, is to encourage students to read newspapers from the local area, books, talk to people, native um, um, people from that country, previous volunteers, previous students, um, anything they can do to um, increase their cultural literacy before they go in country is essential. Um, and then finally, um, social media. Um, even since I've stepped down from being the global health track director, this is just ballooned into such a huge part of global education. Um, and communication, and yet, as of uh, a couple of years ago, there was a literature review that looked at this and found that only about a third of all pre-departure training programs that were found in the United States had training specifically about how students should comport themselves on social media when in country. So that is, I think, absolutely essential moving forward. Um, in terms of post-departure, this is uh, something that sometimes gets neglected, and it was honestly my favorite part. <laughs> 
of running the track because they come back, these students would come back with these amazing experiences and just giving them a forum to discuss those was so wonderful. Um, we did a lot of reflection sessions. Um, I encouraged my students to keep one sentence journals while they were in country. Um, it was a trick that I picked up. I'm too busy to keep a journal myself, but I always said that if I could write one sentence a night, then I could keep with it. And so that's what I encourage my students. Like just write one sentence a night that reminds you of what you did. And, and it was so interesting to review those and to talk with students through those. Equip your students and your trainees with mental health resources when they come back. Culture shock is a real thing. It is a big deal. It is hard to predict who's going to have more culture shock than someone else. Um, and again, even with the best training, there can be bad outcomes. There can be really hard situations. Um, so we want to make sure that our students are supported when they get back. Um, and then finally, one thing that I encourage my students to do is to write essays, to write reflective pieces, to publish, to talk about their experiences as much as they could. Um, and that was great, you know, five years ago when I was running this. Now when we have these online platforms like Medium and Twitter, and I think there's so many opportunities to do this. It's, it's really an exciting time um, for students to be able to reflect in a way that can be shared um, in, a, in a scholarly way with others. And then finally, this formal agreement with hosts, I think is absolutely essential to the safety in, of the students and also the patients that they're taking care of. There should be objectives and expectations. The level of supervision should be very clear before the student travels. Um, student vetting and evaluation, we were very um, deliberate about who we chose for the global health track at the U. And then again, that meant that we were basically selecting people who we thought would be able to handle a global health elective and to comport themselves well and get something out of it. Um, it, it, that I think is really important, um, making sure that the, the, the right student is fitting into the right global health elective. Something that I think is really interesting is Dr. Richards, who's one of the faculty here who runs the South Africa elective for medical students, has started recruiting preceptors from the hospital in South Africa to interview the students that want to go on his elective. Um, and it's really cool to get their input to decide which students are going to come aboard. And of course, and it's kind of like, well, of course, we should have been doing this, right? Um, but it actually is a pretty new and exciting thing. Um, and then this idea of compensation and reciprocity. Uh, I had one rotation in Nepal that we had started that um, the hospital itself charged a small fee for students to rotate through their institution. And I thought that was completely appropriate. Um, I love the idea of reciprocity and bringing over providers from other countries to work with us. Uh, it is frustrating, I think, for both them and us that all they can do is observerships and shadowing, which can be a little bit hard. But I do think that's better than nothing in that case. Um, and there is some discussion among educators that we should actually be creating a protected visa program for these providers to come over and truly actually provide care. So we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> Um, so what's the responsibility of our students and our, and our residents? Well, their personal health and safety. The last thing we want to do is infantilize our students and our trainees. These are adults. They know what they're doing. We are going to equip them with everything we can for success. But once they're in country, um, we have to be able to trust them to do what they need to do to keep themselves safe and their patients safe. Um, know before you go training the basic logistics of like where to keep your money, make sure you have a copy of your passport, register with the State Department. Those sort of things are absolutely essential and should be included in training. We required our students to have a visit with the travel clinic to make sure their immunizations were up to date and any medications they might need while they're in the country were uh, ready to go. Um, and again, the student needs to have a well-developed contingency plan, no, knowledge of their own health and safety resources. Our students had to know where the nearest hospital was, what the capability of that hospital was, excuse me, um, and then online resources that they could contact if they needed evacuation. And then the code of contact, the rules have not changed simply because you're not on American soil. Um, you still need to comport yourself as a, as a uh, representative of your institution and be aware that what happens there is not okay simply because it's there if it wouldn't be okay here. Um, they need to apply the principles that we give them in training. And I'm a big believer in giving something back. The beauty of the Global Health Track was that our students were required to craft their um, mentored scholarly activity around their global health activity. And so we had students who were doing, for instance, my Nepal students went and created a survey 
um, to be administered to first-time mothers at the satellite clinics um, from Julekel Hospital, the hospital in Nepal, um, to identify barriers to um, exclusive breastfeeding. And the idea was that this information could then be given to the providers who were working in these antenatal clinics um, to help them encourage uh, new mothers to exclusively breastfeed. So any opportunities we have for them to collaborate with local researchers, with local providers to improve the care of their patients long after the students leave, I think is really important. Um, I don't know how I am on time. Oh, gosh. All right. I'm going to go through this really quick because <laughs> I do want a little discussion. When we're looking for global health electives for our students, we want um, to pick, situ uh, pick electives that have a common mission, that are collaborative with the local, local um, providers, with the local organizations. We want it to have an educational component, a service component. Um, it should be a multidisciplinary team. We want it to be sustainable, and we want to evaluate it. I'm going to fly through this. Sorry. Uh, a common mission statement is really helpful when you have a elective where you have a lot of personnel turnover, you have a lot of new students and residents coming through. A common mission will help unify them and really make sure everybody's on the same page moving forward. Collaboration. Um, I actually used this example from a University of Washington program, a pediatric rotation or a elective that goes down to El Salvador, and they partner with a local organization called Enlis, um, which is focused on solutions to poverty. They have an, their own health committee as part of that organization, and a local physician visits weekly with this uh, the visiting elective residents to um, see the the program and kind of what they're doing. Um, education, the, the residents who participate in this particular rotation in El Salvador are required to give charlas or talks um, to their patients. Um, they engage in journal clubs along with the other providers in country. Um, and then when they come back, they need to educate themselves and their peers on what they did. Um, so lots of opportunities for education when they go. Service, um, any medical donations that are made have to adhere to the World Health Organization recommendations and local needs. Um, they do needs assessments to see what the community needs and change the services, the, provi the care that they're providing accordingly. And they make sure that they have appropriate referral mechanisms to local physicians. Teamwork, this organization is cool because they bring down specialists from other, um, like, so not just pediatricians, they bring down family practice, they bring down dentists, they have physical therapists, they have this multidisciplinary team, which I think is really cool and a great way to learn. And then all volunteers have to be oriented um, by this local community group. Um, sustainability, they work in a single location, they come to the same place all of the time with the same stakeholders, they work within existing systems of care, like I said, they're working with local providers, and there's this emphasis again on teaching and not just care, um, so I think that's really important. I actually, this picture on the right is um, a training program I did in Turkey when I was a resident, um, where we taught a 40 course in emergency medicine. We taught it to emergency physicians in Turkey who then took the course and then taught it to general practitioners all over Turkey in a, what's called a train the trainers model. And we ended up training something like 2,500 physicians in this and it was so cool and it was amplified. And now, and after we left, the Turkish physicians were still doing it. And it was just such a great example of a sustainable and impactful project. Um, Students should be evaluated, the program should be constantly evaluated to make sure that what's being provided is meeting the needs of the community and meeting the, the trainees who are going and embarking on these uh, electives. Whew, sorry. <laughs> um, I am gonna try to provide some of these resources to anyone who's interested. Um, but like I said, anyone who's interested in giving uh, pre-departure training to their students, um, there is a wealth of online uh, free resources. So. Um, if you want to check out what the Global Health Track is doing at the U of Colorado, obviously that's a good place to see kind of what we were up to and what they're doing now. Um, Boston University has a practitioner's guide in global health, which is basically a package deal, um, know before you go, pre-departure training. That's great for students. It was created in part actually by one of the Denver Health Emergency Medicine graduates who is now at BU. The Consortium for Universities in Global Health has a ton of information, um, online modules, uh, specific disease instruction, um, ethics modules, health systems, economics, it's awesome. 
Um, Sugar Prep is cool. It's a collection of videos on um, like how to use local supplies or clinical hacks um, to work in low-income countries. Um, there's a cool one on there that I teach where you can make a bubble CPAP out of a plastic water bottle and some oxygen tubing. Um, so it's a pretty cool resource. And then Unite for Sight, which is an organization that does um, eye surgeries, um, actually has a really nice website that talks about how to pick a good medical elective and um, sort of the pitfalls to avoid. And they also have links to conferences and even a fellowship, which is kind of neat. Um, and I'm just going to end by talking a little bit about, I think I'd be a little remiss not to bring up the fact that I'm talking about global health during pandemic. Um, I joked to Molly that the reason I had time to write this is because I currently run a fellowship in which travel isn't allowed. <laughs> um, but again, what I love about global health and about people who are passionate about global health is that what we're really passionate about for the, the vast majority of us is health equity. Like that's what this is about. The whole idea that where you're born shouldn't determine if you live or not is just a like that is that is cornerstone to both health equity and global health that's the mission that we can all rally around and there are a thousand different ways to do that without traveling anywhere you can focus on access to care and care quality for vulnerable populations you can focus on innovation in telehealth and fomed our group at the at, in our department our global health group has been really turning the focus and saying, okay, well, what do we really need to travel for and what can we be doing to collaborate and work with our in-country providers without leaving Denver? And it's really forced the issue for us to, to think about this a little bit more critically and see what we can do. Um, and the other thing I love about this focus is that it's inclusive of more learners. I had a lot of students who couldn't travel because of cost, because of family commitments. I had students who were Allowing students to do global health locally is so much more inclusive and I'm super excited to kind of see how creative we can be and really, really capturing that cadre of students who can't or won't travel um, to allow them to develop this passion too. So there's a good, there's a silver lining for sure. Uh, and that's all I have. I'm just leave you with this quote. And um, I think there's a couple of questions in the chat. I apologize for running over. I had time this, but I went long in the tooth, apparently. So thank you, uh, and thank you to the Academy. And this was amazing. And I hope there is, uh, this is helpful and there's some good questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitfield. That was a great talk. And I think we all learned multiple things that we hadn't heard before. Um, I'm going to open it up. If you have questions that you just want to type into the chat box, feel free to type in the chat box. Um, or we can, you could unmute and just ask a question. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start it off, Dr. Whitfield. Um, you, you sort of alluded to social media training um, for students before they go on rotations. And I'm interested to hear what that consists of and if you could expand a little bit on what are the kind of general um oh i can't think of the word that's probably because i worked all night um uh, sort of I best practice best practices or um etiquette etiquette yeah. was the word i was looking for um in terms of social media and documenting your rotation or experiences publicly yeah you know i i um I don't think I'm an expert in this, unfortunately. Um, and uh, you know, I unfortunately, I, for better or worse, have this approach like, just don't be a knucklehead. Like, of course, don't, <laughs> don't post things that you wouldn't post here. And I, I think, for the most part, that that inc that follows, right? Um, we have to just be very careful of assuming that, for instance, photographs, right? Photographs of our patients. Like, you wouldn't just take a photograph of a patient here and post it on your Twitter account. I would hope most students would do that. But it might not necessarily occur to them that that's not okay abroad for whatever reason, because they're there, because, oh, maybe the patient will never see it. Oh, because they're not on Twitter, or, you know, whatever is going through the student's head that thinks that this is okay. So I, I think, as elementary as that might sound, there is still this disconnect of like, I'm over there, the rules can be different. And so this, I just think reiterating what the rules, the code of conduct is, the home institution and making sure that applies abroad is really important. And then taking that to an extra step, honestly, before a student posts anything on social media or any of us post anything on social media, 
think, would it be okay here? And then if you say yes, think, okay, but is it still okay there? Because you're, you are inevitably working with vulnerable populations, disadvantaged, can you truly get consent? That, that I think are the things we need to focus on. Um, and I don't have a clear answer for that. What I do know is that we need to put our collective heads together and be very, very clear and specific on what's allowed and what isn't. Um, because I think there's a slippery slope there and I think it, it can be quite dangerous. Even in this lecture as I was going through it, and I mean, I lecture on this stuff, but there are photos and I wish I could have gone back and changed them where there are pictures where my students had taken pictures with other people and they had gotten permission for it, but then I didn't get tacit or I didn't get ex explicit permission to do it in the lecture. And so I was like, should I use it or not? Like, even I'm stuck with that stuff. So I think there's just, it's a discussion that's ongoing and, and we need smarter people than me to figure it out. <laughs> I had a question. Um, thanks so much for doing yeah. this. Um, it's really great to have this topic for the Academy and we appreciate your enthusiasm and passion. One of the questions I had is related to supporting students who are um, doing a global health elective or residents who are doing a global health elective, not just with the um, educators who might be on the ground, but virtually through our own um, you know, system here. So when I was the program director, I had students who were residents who were in Malawi and had a faculty member there, but we also did a phone call every week to talk about what issues were coming up. Cause I think this, this issue of mental health and um, challenges of the things that they're seeing um, might be might be a big one and one that we can overcome, especially since we've learned how to do things like Zoom a lot better um, than yeah. previously. Um, I love that. That is something I didn't even think about this. Again, one of these silver lining side effects of being grounded is that um, I, historically, I think we send students over and then we talk to them when they get back, right? And it's, right. it's this like, okay, well, how was it, right? And why aren't we doing check-ins? Like it's so easy to do now. And granted your bandwidth and your access to internet is gonna be different depending on where you are, but it's not hard to figure out exactly what that's gonna look like ahead of time. Um, and making sure there's at least access for these check-ins. And moreover, I think that what those check-ins look at like should be pretty deliberate. And, and hopefully we can arm ourselves as educators with like, okay, we need to be able to kind of pick out the red flag warnings and see if we can really figure out if our student is struggling or not and, and how we can best support them while they're in country so that we don't wait for them to have a four or six week experience that is really tough and then come back and try to unpack that. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. We actually had them join into morning report um, and so present in the regular morning report a patient that they were seeing there and give feedback and you know kind of community support to them too from their fellow residents who were like wow I can't you know you're so amazing to you know sit at their bedside all night long and things like that. <laughs> yes yes global health electives and volunteer work can be incredibly isolating um, and particularly if you're speaking a language that isn't a native one to you I speak Spanish, but even when I go to Latin America, I'm drained by the end of the day because I feel a little isolated. Like it, that sounds amazing. And I think that would be a, like, if I had had that, I would have been overjoyed um, because it just would have been so, it would have been that breath of fresh air and that sort of like, you're doing a good thing. What you're doing as matters is an impactful and important. And here's your whole community at home that's supporting you. I think that's, that's a really, really good thing. Um, if there aren't any more questions, it looks like the scanner's up for the evaluation, Erin. Am I correct? <clears throat> yep. We ask that um, everyone fill out the um, evaluation if they are able to. Um, that would help us with our planning for future sessions. Um, this was wonderful. Thank you, Erin, for all your help and Shanta, everybody. I mean, you guys were amazing. So thank you and happy Juneteenth. Go join the celebration wherever it is. And um, yeah, thanks again. Thanks, Jen. We're so happy. We're so lucky to have you here, Dr. Whitfield. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thiessen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.